Hi, welcome to Kingsway. We're really glad you're joining us. Welcome to Kingsway. Welcome home. Welcome, welcome to, to Kingsway. Kingsway. Hello, welcome to Kingsway. We're so glad you joined us today. Welcome to church. Welcome to church. Welcome to Kingsway. We're glad you're here. Thank you for joining us today. We are so happy you are joining us today. If you are new to Kingsway, we would love to get to know you better. Just click the connect link in our video description. Now join with us as we worship and hear the word. Welcome to Kingsway. Welcome home.
Jesus, I pray that you would be present in um, in the lives of those who are experiencing illness right now, Lord. I pray for healing, I pray for peace, I pray for comfort, um, and I pray for your wisdom for the doctors, nurses, and, and health practitioners that are, are caring for those who are ill right now. God, I pray for this whole COVID pandemic situation. I know that this whole situation seems so out of control in so many places. I pray that you would give wisdom to um, the leadership of the countries who are not doing so well at this moment. God, I pray that you would be you would be present in the situation. I pray for our southern neighbors, especially that you would um, you would protect them. That you would give wisdom to uh, the the government um, on the state and federal level to navigate this situation. And God, I pray that you would protect. All of the people that we love um, in the U.S. and and in other countries that are more at risk for COVID right now, God. And I also just want to thank you for our government and our leadership um, that have done a really good job in this situation. And I want to thank you especially for Dr. Bonnie Henry. God. I also pray for um, the social unrest that is happening around the world right now. God, I pray that you would use this situation to really bring to light um, places that need justice, systems of oppression that need to be changed, God, and and I pray that you would bring healing into all of these situations, and God, we recognize um, that the church has adopted these systems of systemic racism and oppression um, within within our church bodies, Lord, that we've replicated those aspects of the world in the church. I pray for your mercy, your forgiveness, your healing, um, your peace, and, and your wisdom for the church leadership is as this is becoming much more acknowledged, I pray that you would bring justice into our church um, as well as into our world. And I, and I pray that we would be able to listen to you. Um, you were a, a refugee, a man of color in a racist and oppressive system and, and God you you came to those who were even more vulnerable than you and I pray that we would live that out in our lives in our church and in our world Lord I pray for wisdom for our leaders within the government and the church as they are navigating really difficult difficult times um I pray especially for the Canadian government as they're making a lot of decisions that could shape our society for generations to come. I pray for your wisdom. I pray for your healing. I pray for your justice, Lord. And and I just pray that, that there would be real positive change in, 
all of the changes, um, all of the unrest, this pandemic, everything, God, I pray that you would use it for your good, Lord. And I just want to thank you that we can rest in your hands at peace um, in the midst of a tumultuous and unpredictable world, Lord. We know that, that you are in control, and we thank you for that. Amen. Good morning, Kingsway. I've got three announcements for you guys. First one, Kingsway Kids Camp registration deadline. It's coming up real quick. It's tomorrow. So get your kids camp registrations in ASAP. Don't want to miss the jet deadline. It's July 20th. Second announcement is that there is a Zoom prayer meeting, um, and that is August the 2nd. It's at 6.30. And it's on a Sunday evening. A link will be sent out the morning of. Please don't want to miss that. And finally, I just wanted to thank um, those of you who are continuing to support the church. It means a lot during this time. We're really grateful. So hope you guys enjoy the rest of the service. Hi Kingsway, we are uh, continuing our s series on spiritual stability in Philippians chapter 4 and we've been addressing the question, um, how do we keep our spiritual balance in the face of tests and trials and our weakness and temptation and persecution and doubt, uh, all the things that we experience in this life, how can we stand spiritually firm and strong? Uh, is it possible at all to experience peace and calm, uh, to have a settled heart and contentment and confidence in the midst of life's, life's stresses? In Psalm chapter 38, the writer is David, and he's under incredible stress. And he, he writes, O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. He, he, was, he was dealing with the guilt of sin and in his life and also the discipline of God on top of the guilt he was feeling for his sin. Uh, he says, there's no health in my body. My bones have no soundness. Uh, he was beginning to feel it physically. Uh, he says, no health in my bones because of my sin. And, and David begins to think about how serious his sin is. And he says, my guilt overwhelmed me like a burden, too heavy to bear. Do you ever, do you ever feel that way? My, my wounds fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. I, I am bowed and brought very low all day. I go about mourning, he says. There's, there's no health in my body. He was feeling uh, the pain and the guilt uh, of his sin and the, the discipline of the Lord was heavy on him and on top of his sinful anguish. And in fact, it got to the point in verse eight of chapter 38, where he says, I am feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. He continues, my heart pounds, my, my strength fails me. Even the light has gone from my eyes. There's no joy. There's no gleam in his eyes anymore. Wow. That, this is a downer, eh? My start to the sermon, Darren. <laughs> well, then to add to it, David writes, My friends and companions, they avoid me because of my wounds. My neighbors stay far from me. He's, he's saying he has no comforters, no commiserators, no counselors, no helpers in his life. He has enemies. Verse 12, those, those who seek my life set their traps. Those who would harm me talk of my ruin. All day long they plot deception. This, this is a guy who is in distress from every angle. Distressed because of his sin, distressed because of God's discipline in his life, because his friends are not coming to help him. He is lonely and forsaken. He's distressed because he's attacked by his enemies uh, who seek to destroy his life. And he's distressed because he knows his own sinfulness and has no argument for it, no defense. All he can do is pray and cry out to God. So in verse 9, David says, All my longings and desires, they lie open before you, O Lord. My, my sighing and crying <clears throat> is not hidden from you. 
In other words, you know what I'm going through, he says to God. You know my pain. You understand it all. And later he writes, I will wait for you. You will answer, O Lord my God. He prayed and he knew God would answer him. Then at the end of the psalm, David says, Do not be far from me, God. Come quickly to help me, O Lord my Savior. This is a man of God under great distress. He has enemies who hate him and, and friends who seem to be of little use to him in his time of need. Uh, he is numb and badly crushed, even to the point of physical exhaustion and defeat. His heart is agitated and he is shaky and unstable. And that is putting it mildly, it seems like. This kind of instability is at times the experience of every Christian. Uh, sometimes it can get so severe that we lose the ability to function. We feel the exact same feelings that David felt. And he wrote them down for generations to read. Don't, don't you love the Bible's honesty? I love how honest the Bible is. Um, uh, like him, we can, we can kind of become so burdened by our anxieties and guilt and hostility and persecution and self-loathing uh, that we totally lose our balance. Could a pastor be numbed and crushed by life? Uh, can a psalm writer, the very apple of God's eye, it said, King David himself, can he be numbed and crushed? Can you, yourself, be in such difficulty where you are numb and crushed by life? Losing your spiritual equilibrium and losing your spiritual balance? Yeah, apparently so. All of us at times find ourselves weak and unable to stand firm. So where do we go? We must turn to the only one who is our deliverance, the only one who is our salvation, the only one who knows our very hearts. Uh, and that, that's God. It's precisely whom Paul wants to to turn the whole Philippian church towards. He wants to turn us towards in the scriptures. So the question is, how can we be like that? How can we stand strong? Let's let's review the first few verses of chapter 4. We've gone over them already in the previous weeks. There's some key principles to being spiritually stable. Uh, first of all, Paul calls us to be at peace in our relationships. That's, that's cultivating peace in the fellowship of believers. Are, have you been able to do that with the people around you? Have you been cultivating and bringing, making peace? He writes for the church to be joyful in life. Maintaining a spirit of rejoicing in the Lord, regardless of our circumstances. He says to be humble in our attitude and accepting less than what we are due, what we feel we deserve. And we need to be okay with that. Uh, having uh, daily trust in the Lord, living in that way that we trust him, having a confident faith that the Lord is near and so that we are not as anxious. Thankful in prayer. He says to be thankful in prayer. Our response to problems should be in thanksgiving, because thanksgiving kills worry. Those could be summed up as five uh, basic virtues or spiritual attitudes, you know, peace, joy, humility, faith, gratitude. They're, they're like Christ attitudes, and they are the fruit that people see in us when we're living those things out. Then last week, we saw how important it was to focus and to think on godly virtues. So thinking godly thoughts. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Think about such things. Thinking is vital. Thinking about those lovely, admirable, true things of God can insulate the battlefield of your mind from the things that assault you. And note that Paul didn't call people to do anything that he wasn't living out himself. Um, remember, he was writing this letter to the Philippians as a prisoner in Rome and was actually chained to a soldier during these times. So that guy, he must have heard the good news a few times, right? Uh, so we've read in Philippians 4 about spiritual attitudes and spiritual thinking, and it all lines up to culminate today with spiritual action. Um, in fact, you can't have spiritual action without, meaning you can't live for Christ in a good way, without having first spiritual attitudes and spiritual thinking. So Paul's saying practice godly attitudes and thoughts. Um, regarding the series that we've been looking at, let's, let's read Philippians chapter 4, 
verse 9. One verse today. He wrote, Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Paul knew that uh, thoughts can never be separated from action, bad or good. You know, bad behaviors first start with a thought. Uh, my own evil desire, and uh, they start with my own evil desires and then move towards bad actions, right? The devil didn't really make you do it. You know, we'd like to, uh, we'd like to uh, place the blame somewhere else, don't we? Uh, but the reality is, I thought it and then I did it. However, the same can be said of good actions and behaviors. They also start with a thought, with our thinking. And that's why Paul is so strongly urging us to think on good things and to, to let the Holy Spirit guide our living. Um, I would encourage you to watch last week's service um, from uh, Philippians chapter 4, 8 and 9. Paul says to now put into practice those good attitudes and thoughts. We've talked about attitudes and thoughts. Now put them into practice. The, the Greek word he uses there for practice is paso. Uh, it's not the same as the word for do. Like there's practice and then there's do. There's a poeo is the Greek word for do. And that do word uh, is common. It's a common verb kind of meaning repetition. Um, it's like um, shooting free throws for basketball practice. And, and as an aside, we've been told, maybe you've heard this, that practice makes perfect. But that's only true if you're doing it right. If you're practicing wrong, uh, you will learn it wrong very well. You'll, you'll do it very well, but wrong. Now, I was told in grade eight basketball camp and it stuck with me all these years, perfect practice makes perfect. And obviously I didn't practice enough because I'm not in the NBA like I thought I would be. So uh, that's not what Paul's talking about here, that kind of that kind of practicing. He's talking about practice, the paso Greek word, meaning the normal routine, meaning it's one's life, like a like a doctor or a lawyer's practice. It's different than practicing something in order to improve themselves, right? We hope that. Uh, what they do is their way of life. It's their routine. It's their practice to do that. And Paul is saying that Christian living should be our practice. It should be our normal routine. It should be our pattern of life, how we conduct ourselves. Godly attitudes of peace, joy, humility, faith, gratitude, godly thoughts uh, about thinking things that are right and true and lovely and honorable, and then godly practices. That means godly deeds and, and spiritual actions. I know, and you know, and Paul knows that the inability to firmly stand one's ground and to live a balanced Christian life is directly related to the absence of spiritual attitudes and spiritual thoughts. And without those virtues, we can't act also in a spiritual manner. And guess what? No one can do it for us. Not even Pastor Barry. The, we are the only ones responsible for walking in the Spirit so that He produces His fruit and His character in us. We are the only ones responsible to go to the Word of God in order to find thoughts that are true and noble and right and pure and lovely and excellent and praiseworthy. You can't do it for me, and I can't do it for you. You're responsible for it. Um, here's um, how attitudes and thoughts eventually help our actions. Uh, on on Tuesday night, this week, uh, I was driving back from Abbotsford. I'd seen my, my brothers and sisters and we hung out a bit and, uh, you know, physically distanced in my mom's house. And on the highway, coming back into Burnaby, there was a big slowdown and yeah, all the cars were backed up. And when I finally got close enough to see what the problem was, I saw that the police had pulled over a car and it was lit up like Christmas. I mean, there were three police cars, an ambulance, a fire truck, all, all the lights flashing and lighting up the night. And it was around 1030. There were um, hands on holsters and shouting and they pulled the guy out of the car in cuffs. Uh, onlookers were all curious, including me. Now, of course, um, preachers, we view the world as nothing but a series of sermon illustrations. And so in thinking about that event, it kind of helps tie in a bit of an analogy here. Um, if a police officer sees a crime being committed or sees someone violating the law, he, he arrests them. 
That's his job. I mean, that's what they're supposed to do. They don't try them and judge them and sentence them. The courts do that. They just go find them and arrest them. And in a sense, that's kind of the principle we're talking about here. When you have godly attitudes and, and godly thoughts at work in your life, they kind of act like a policeman who arrests uh, your flesh before it can commit the crime. Uh, your sinful nature, guess what? It always wants to disobey God's standards. That's the way it is. You cannot reform sin or make it better or good or righteous. And as it moves that way against God, your policeman in you can arrest it, preventing it from committing a crime spree against God's best for your life. And that's what it's like for those who have um, spiritual attitudes and thinking, because when they get a thought that's out of uh, line or, or completely sinful, the some sort of siren goes off and lights start flashing and the, the attitudes and thoughts, they kick in. They go, that's not right. Um, you know, that's, that doesn't line up with what God wants for my life. You're under arrest, bad thought. And they hopefully take it captive before it can give birth to a sinful action. Those attitudes and thoughts that we've been talking about for weeks, uh, they're really the spiritual police for our practice of faith. And you know what? If your attitudes aren't being produced by the Spirit and your thinking isn't governed by the Word of God, then that spiritual policeman is really not on duty. And if he's not around, he can't arrest anybody. And that's why you and I, we give in to our poor thinking and then we move on to sinful actions. Have you ever seen something and thought, where is a cop when you need him? Well, the police can be active in your spiritual life. Because last week we mentioned 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. It said this, we demolish arguments. And every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. That was Paul writing to the Corinthian church. Do you want to fight against those, those thoughts that debilitate your life? Those, those thoughts that you know are negative. Uh, you know they, they eat you up inside. You, you know they are not true to what God says about you. Uh, well, the weapons of our warfare as a, as a believer in Jesus, they're not carnal. They're not fleshly. I can't just try harder in the physical or talk myself into thinking better. Um, our weapons against this enemy are spiritual and spiritual attitudes and thinking and actions will bring everything captive to the obedience of Christ. So bring those thoughts to the chief prison guard, Jesus, and leave them there. That's what that section in, in 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 10 says. Um, it says, take your thoughts to God. So you can, you can be even singing the, the, um, the cops theme song if you want you know bad thoughts bad thoughts what you gonna do what you gonna do when they come for you i heard that sh show was canceled hmm. well not all the police are good but the spiritual police are good paul in philippians chapter 4 verse 9 basically says follow me as i follow christ and he tells the believers to put it into practice this is what he's saying that we read earlier he says, first, practice what you have learned. They, they had been discipled. The people of Philippi had been instructed and taught by Paul, sometimes uh, in a preaching setting, I'm sure, in the temple or in the synagogue, um, sometimes in a teaching circumstance, just walking down the street, often house to house, talking to family around the dinner table. Uh, Paul was expounding on Old Testament truths, on, on the meaning of uh, some New Testament revelation that he's received from God, explaining how to apply it to their lives. Uh, they had been learning from Paul. And he said to practice what you've learned. Then he said to practice what you've received. And some would say that that's synonymous with practicing what you've learned. But I think Paul had some specific things in mind. Um, Paul's priority was to give others the word of God. He wanted others to know the word of God, which he had received from the Lord, and he wanted others to receive it as well. Paul's saying um, that what God delivered to me, I received. What I delivered to you, you received. He's talking about the treasure of scripture, and it's, it's, it's what he is talking about when he says in another letter to Timothy, the things you receive from me among many witnesses, the same commit 
to faithful men and women who will be able to teach others also. Uh, so in other words, you've received it, now pass it on. Deliver it to the next generation. He's passing on the baton of the word of God. We also need to practice what we've received. Paul says, practice what you've heard. In regards to Paul's life for Christ, he had a reputation. People talked about his lifestyle, the miracles, the testimonies, many people coming to Jesus because of Paul's ministry. He's, he's saying it has spurred, if it has spurred you on to hear about me and to follow Christ, then practice what you've heard about me and practice what you've seen. He says, this is, this is a personal firsthand experience. You've seen my life. He says, you've observed me. I've been with you. We've gone through tough times together. Everything you've observed in me about walking with Jesus Christ, do it as a way of life. If you've seen it, then do it. It's a question. Who is learning from you? Who is receiving from you, hearing your words and, and watching your life? Uh, your, your kids are, your spouse is, your co-workers are, your girlfriend, your boyfriend are, your, your friends are, your frenemies are. Everyone sees in your life. And James chapter 1 verse 22 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So practice it. And we're not apostles. You're not an apostle like Paul. I'm not an apostle like Paul. But we also ought to be imitated as we follow Jesus Christ, like he said. Paul ends verse 9 with the promise of God's peace. Um, the, the God of peace will be with you. He will guard you, he says in, in that section. God is a God of a lot of things, right? He's the God of love. He's the God of grace. He's the, the God of mercy, the God of compassion. Um, our God is the God of all comfort, the God of justice, the God of power, the God of light, the God of life. He's the God of a lot of things. Why does Paul use the expression God of peace? Well, because he's talking about being spiritually strong, being spiritually stable and firm, uh, content in the midst of difficulty. And he's talking about something very personal that he knew a lot about. He knew a lot about God's peace because Paul was in trouble all the time. If you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, there's a big section. It's like 10 or 11 verses of a list of just difficulties he's gone through and trials and temptations and hostilities and, and tests and shipwrecks and all and so forth and so on. Uh, God's peace was very real for Paul. He found the Lord to be reliable in his promise of peace to those who followed him. So he thinks you should take that promise to the bank too. Believe it. The God of peace will be with you, he says. In conclusion, what's your routine? What's your practice? Uh, are you a doctor? Practice. Are you a lawyer? Practice. Are you a teacher, an accountant, uh, a homemaker uh, in retail sales? Practice. Are you a Christian? Practice. Practice having Holy Spirit-empowered attitudes and thinking. Then practice living out spiritual actions and behaviors. I think that's what Paul wanted for the Philippian church, and I think that's what he would say would be good for the Kingsway church as well. Make living for Jesus Christ the practice of your everyday life. May it become just natural for you. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we need your spirit to help us with our attitudes. We need your spirit to help us with our thinking. We need your spirit to help us with our actions, to live every day for you. Jesus, would you be with all who have been out of practice in their godly attitudes and godly thinking? Uh, be knocking, Lord, on the hearts of those who have never made a uh, conscious decision to follow Jesus fully, to follow Jesus with their whole lives. And may your grace be so near to us, so near to those who are having difficulty with relying on your righteousness instead of their own. Lord, I pray that our actions would be filled with your purposes and that we would know your peace. Fill us anew, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, is there a cop around when you need one? Uh, is your police officer on duty today? Practice taking some thoughts captive 
and making them obedient to Christ this week. Think about those things that are harassing you, those thoughts, those negative things, because the Bible says you have the power to bring them to Christ and leave them there. Take them captive. Now join uh, Beth and I this morning uh, for a live chat to touch base uh, as the Kingsway Church together right here on the same YouTube channel. Uh, just click refresh on your device and you'll find us. God bless you.